Okay, hello everyone. Welcome to the RACI Pharmaceuticals, Pharmaceutical Sciences Group. Sorry, I've practiced that 30 times and I still stuffed it up. Uh, Pharmaceutical Sciences Group seminar on data integrity. And uh, it's fabulous to see everyone uh, in this forum face to face. Um, the room was just a buzz with all the, the chat and the networking that's happening already. Thank you for your patience. We have uh, a cohort of people online joining us as well. So uh, the tech is quite new to us and we thank you for your patience with getting started. Uh, we, acknowledge the Australia, we acknowledge Australia's Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples as the traditional custodians and first scientists, makers and innovators of this land and their continuing connection to country. We pay respect to elders past and present and emerging and extend our respect to all Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander people attending today. We have a very full program, so it's with great pleasure that I uh, welcome Dr. Laura McKemish to uh, present for us. Laura is a senior lecturer in the School of Chemistry and coordinator of the SciEx High School Outreach Summer School. She considers herself a quantum chemist and molecular physicist. Her expertise is in theoretical and computational modeling of molecules, particularly their spectroscopy for astrochemistry applications. <sighs> <That's enough. laughs> uh, welcome, Laura. And if we have time at the end of Laura's presentation, we may take a few questions, but uh, we are aiming for some time for Q&A at the end of the, the seminar after all our presenters have uh, presented. And if you're online, uh, please use the Q&A function to submit your questions. Thank you. I think I've skipped some slides for you. Uh, yeah, that's okay. Okay. Um, so where's the mic coming from Zoom? Yeah. Uh, just stay here. Cool. Okay. So we've skipped some slides. Um, I'm really delighted to be, have been invited. Thank you, David, to present at this um, seminar series, or seminar, I guess, today. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of a different perspective on data. So as um, I was introduced, I'm actually a computational astrochemist. I am going to hopefully link it back to the sort of things that you guys are interested in, and I'll tell you about that as we go. So the first thing to get across is that I am not a chemist that ever goes into a lab, um, unless I'm teaching. I'm a chemist that does all my work on a computer, which is what I like. But computational chemists nowadays, there's actually lots of different varieties of them. And one question you guys might have is, can I model your drug binding to your protein? And the answer is probably not. So I'm someone who works a lot more at the fundamental side, small molecules, really high accuracy, and using quantum rather than molecular mechanics. So that drug binding into our protein site is really the more classical end. And the way that I think about it is that the methods that I'm developing at the moment will be what the drug modelers can do in 20, 30 years. So I design, I develop methods now and then it goes bigger and bigger and bigger and I'll figure out what works and what doesn't. And fortunately there is a community that does want the applications of what I'm doing. So um, a lot of this molecular detection in exoplanets, in stars, in the interstellar medium, anytime you want to find a molecule in space, um, I might be able to help you there. Um, so I do a bit of benchmarking and method development. That's probably a little bit more for the details, but basically it's a bit more writing the programs and figuring out what you should do. And there's other people that deal a bit more with what happens in particular systems. But as you'll see in this sort of overview, I'm going to start with my research, but I'm actually going to go broadly into computational chemistry and give you just a little bit of an overview if you haven't heard of the field before and talk about what it can and can't do. Um, and I'm actually going to bring it around to AI in the pharmaceutical industry, not because I have much experience in AI. Honestly, my biggest um, experience is probably that my husband is in uh, machine learning. So he tells me stuff and then I try and decipher it. But I can definitely tell you about where, when I go to conferences, I see artificial intelligence, machine learning, 
moving into the chemistry domain and actually linking with the topic of today, data is the key. There's all these fancy algorithms, they go a computer can think, all these things. Honestly, it's all about data. Getting your data good, big, strong, <laughs> um, doing all the things you wanna do, and then you can do the machine learning if you want to. Um, as we've talked about before, I also spend a lot of time teaching and doing outreach. And I'll just briefly mention that at the end. Um, so astrochemistry is basically whenever you wanna study molecules or ions in space, that might be in solar system planets, exoplanets, which are planets around stars other than our own, um, stars in the in various sizes, mostly smaller ones or cooler ones, because otherwise there's no molecules, and the interstellar medium. And basically all this comes down to is we're detecting spectral lights. So this is a stellar spectra. Um, all those little lines tell you about the atoms and molecules in the star. This is the sun. Um, but as you might imagine, you actually need quite a bit of background to be able to go, what do these set of lines mean? And if this line's present or this line's not present, does that mean there's this molecule or this molecule at that temperature or that temperature? And that's what I do. And look, I'm not gonna spend too much time talking about it today, but the big goal that you do in public outreach type talks is we're trying to find life um, and maybe a snippet that you can go home and tell your kids or partner, et cetera. Um, we're actually really looking for molecules that we can't explain through geology or normal chemistry and physics. Assuming biology can produce any molecule you like, it's actually more about what, life, uh, what normal planets can't produce. So that's how we're gonna find DT. And if you see some telescope stuff, hopefully you'll know a little bit more about what we're talking about. And so one of the reasons I think I'm talking in a data conference rather than just a computational chemistry conference is in my field to get the data that astronomers need, we actually can't just put it in a computer and see what we do, we're not good enough. We actually really need the experiments. Um, so in this case, they're lasers and optical tables and very fancy bits and pieces. But if we translate that to the pharmaceutical industry, you still need the lab-based experiments. You still need the um, different studies that you're doing to complement the computational data. And if you can bring them together well, then you can achieve what you want to achieve. And so just as an example, this is from the um, Hubble Space Telescope, probably one of the last times I'll actually produce this type of image because we've got a new fancy telescope up. But um, can we see this? No, nope, I'm not gonna, oh, there we go. Anyway, all these lines are spectral lines and basically they tell us that there's molecules in the planet. And so there's data that you get from the telescopes and without the, um, without the data that I provide, you can't actually figure out what molecules it is. And so the one that I particularly look at is actually titanium oxide, which you might have heard about as a molecule in sunscreen or as a solid state white powder. I think about it as diatomic TiO because I like two atoms and it turns out they're really, really present in stars. And yeah, so I like that combination. And so my field has been waiting for literally decades for JWST, the James Webb Space Telescope to launch. Luckily last year we had a bit of a Christmas miracle and the telescope got launched. And fortunately, this is only the, I haven't been able to present this image too much. This is the new telescope that's gonna provide better data than what's already available. And the one that I like to show here is, this is the public image. Uh, I assume we don't have a laser pointer, so I'll see if I can do this. What? Oh, we do have a laser pointer? Okay, well, well I'll go. Uh, okay, so you see how they've found water here and there's some spectral lines on this side on the left that you can't see that haven't been assigned. Honestly, they're probably TIO. So I'm waiting for the paper that tells me that I'm right, but there's actually more data there that we'll be able to figure out. And another thing that I'm interested in and looking at at the moment is this image where we've found CO2 in the exoplanet, but you see this little peak here? There's like a peak in the data. That's the one that's gonna come next. So I've got a student that hopefully is currently sitting there going, what molecule could it be? Because if we think like chemists and convert these weird micron units to wave numbers, um, it's about 2,400, 2,300 wave numbers 
which if you remember from your organic chemistry textbooks, there isn't much that absorbs there. So phosphine actually might be it. Um, I know phosphine absorbs near there. I'm not saying it's actually phosphine because I haven't done the maths, but it's a bit weird. So that's what I do. And I guess the other thing I wanted to say and as a message that I think is very general is that while astronomers were waiting for this big space telescope, they said, well, okay, we've got to wait for them to launch this telescope. We want to do something in the meantime. And they found that their ground-based telescopes could actually accomplish similar things in a very, very different way. Thank you. Oh, perfect. So they've got these fancy ground-based telescopes that are really big. And they found out that on the ground, you've got the atmosphere just makes the signal so noisy, but it's really, really high resolution. So the important thing for this purpose is that there's a different technique and the data requirements are different. So if you've got, um, look, I'm not very good in the pharmaceutical thing, but think about a problem that you've done and think about the fact there might be two techniques to achieve your goal and find your information. And they have very, very different data requirements. And in fact, the data that was available in 2015, um, this is basically a paper that says, Laura, can you please do some work on TIO? Um, we really needed astronomers. And if you just look through this data, hopefully, um, there we go. The black is a star that definitely has TIO. So TIO is the molecule I'll talk about. I won't talk about many others this talk. The black is the data that, um, that's what we want to match. And you can see these three models in 2015 are just not aligning with it. So they're not matching up and the peaks, I think these black lines, you can see some of them are peaks, some of them are troughs, it's just hopeless. So if you're trying to use the colored lines at the bottom to predict the black line at the top, it's useless. And the reason for that is that the accuracy requirements are just so extreme. So we're talking sub-wave number accuracy. So it's going your OH stretches, you know, within 0.3, you've got to know all the spectral lines. And that was just not possible with the previous data, almost. So what I want to highlight to this audience is, um, so I should have used a different term. This Phoenix data, this is from Plez, who's this person in 1998. And he did the data in 1998, but it turned out he'd actually done an updated data in 2012. These people didn't know about it. And so they wrote a paper saying the data isn't good enough, but that actually ignored the best source of information. And if we look in this and look at the PLES 2012 data, which was available at the time these previous people did their experiment, it's actually not bad. Yeah, so I'm not going to go into too much detail, but the PLES 2012 data was pretty good. PLES 1998 was horrible, but there was an update. And what had happened was that the person that had the data had updated it, but they hadn't published and publicized and shouted up and down, everyone please use my new data. And it's definitely better than the old one in this way. And so the astronomers who were using it didn't understand the differences and therefore use the wrong data. And Actually, we went through years of conferences with people telling me to get this data updated. And it wasn't until I did the new data update, um, my line list was called Toto, because um, TAO, it reminded me of Toto the dog. So that was how we named it. Um, and look, Toto is better than the 2012 data, but the 2012 data is a lot better than the 1998 data. And so the lesson I want you guys to learn from this story is your data is going to be updated as you go. You need to tell people what you're doing or at least write it down. The 2012 data was never published because apparently French academics don't need to publish as much as we do, who knows? Um, but it was never published. And so it was online on some website or if you knew the right person and knew the right person and you eventually got the data, there was that lack of data cleanliness and ability to cleanly tell people what data you were using and communicate between people. And I was actually asked at this conference whether um, I could speak about hacking of the data or data, um, well, hacking or how do you preserve the integrity and the confidentiality of your data? Honestly, in my field, it's a little bit more, we need to get the data out there in a clean format for people to use. 
But I think regardless of where you're doing it, and if it's commercial proprietary data, you actually have to be really careful that it's not just one person in your company that knows how to use it. And if that person leaves, what's the data going to do next? And what are the, and you need to have a documentation that says I produce this data in this way, this way, this way. These were my approximations. Here, if I had time and energy, I would improve it in this way. These are the known uncertainties. And that communication is really important. And so important that I've actually got a whole nother slide on it. Um, and actually ended up writing a review on the fact that the data users, in my case, there are astronomers, they need to talk to the experimental data producers, but those people are using completely different languages. I mean, honestly, astronomers were lucky if they know what a spectral, well, they know what a spectral line is, but they don't know that CH absorbs at 3000 wave numbers because they're not chemists. Um, and the theoretical data producers, again, are expert at their field, but they don't necessarily know what the experimentalists are doing and they don't know what the astronomers want. So I was talking to a quantum chemist, they're the theoretical data producers, and she was looking at all these different molecules and I'm like, no one cares about those molecules. Whereas if you do these other molecules that are really reasonably similar from your point of view, everyone cares about them. So TIO, I bet you wouldn't have thought of that before I came up here and told you it was important to astronomers, but I can tell you it is. So if we get that communication happening, then we can look at important molecules, not just whatever ones we think about. And I feel like my job often here is as a linker and communicator to hopefully make sure we're all speaking vaguely the same language. And I actually spend quite a bit of time doing that. So um, writing papers or giving talks about what you need to know to use our data to astronomers and telling quantum chemists, well, what do you need to know about? What do the astronomers want? That communication is really important. And I think synergy, communication, easy data transfer. Um, one big thing, I don't have a particular slide on it, but CSV files are much better than PDFs. And I can't tell you how many PDFs I've um, had to digitize from the 1970s, because that was when all the spectroscopy was done. And then you have to sit there and correct from, you know, the fives become S's and then the ones, you know, they just all the numbers that are wrong. In spectroscopy, we've got really nice clean patterns. We can normally figure it out, but you can imagine that's not that easy in many cases. So just be careful about where you're giving that, um, provide as much information, do the readme. I know it's a pain in the neck. You've produced the data. Last thing you wanna do is write a readme and write a, you know, what did I do and is it important? Take the time, it'll make a difference. Um, so that's sort of my bit on the astronomy. And what I wanted to talk about now that was sort of related-ish was going, well, how does computational chemistry and the sort of things I'm talking about contribute to medicinal chemistry, drug discovery, and the pharmaceutical industry? And as I said before, I'm not an expert in those industries, but I've taught enough students and communicated with enough academics that hopefully I'll tell you some useful things here. Um, and you can ask me some questions and I've definitely got contacts if you're wanting to find out more information and I don't know it. Um, so one thing you might not realize that we're able to do is I can get high school students or first years to within about five minutes, put a molecule in a computer. Um, I tell them what things to press. So that's really my expertise telling you which things to press. I can put the molecule in a computer and I can get information out. And so when I tell you about um, the, all these fancy things, that's my expertise. What I mean by that is that when you're modeling quantum chemistry, there's certain approximations that you might come across. Um, I'm assuming some of you might've heard about this, but anyway, I think it's useful to say. Um, but when you're modeling a molecule on a computer, there's two things you need to decide. And the way I like to think about it is imagining, imagine you're modeling the earth with Lego bricks. If you're modeling a spherical earth, then that's your level of theory because you're assuming that it's just a perfect spherical ball. So that's your level of theory. And if you model the hills and the valleys and the troughs and the fact that it's squished, all that sort of thing, that's a perfect description, the full Schrodinger equation. Um, maybe you're just modeling the squishness and not the hills and valleys, then it might be somewhere in the middle. So there's a hierarchy of methods and if you've heard of density functional theory, that's what that is. So for your field, I imagine density functional theory is the main thing you, that you will have heard of that fits on this diagram. If you want to know about the relative 
accuracy of various methods, that's something that someone like me can tell you. Um, but on the other side, we imagine our round earth and we go, well, how many Lego bricks are we using to design it? So if I give you four Lego bricks, I don't care how many hills and valleys you've got, you're not doing good earth. <laughs> Whereas if I give you a million Lego bricks, you're probably gonna do a pretty good answer. And so we actually, this is called the Popal diagram and we actually aim to go up the diagonal. So is, as you increase the sophistication of your model, you increase the number of Lego bricks so that you might end up with a squished one that sort of represents it pretty well without the hills and valleys. And um, I would say that one thing to be aware of is the people that are applying these methods, their expertise is in often in making it work, which trust me is not actually trivial by any means. And it's also in understanding the chemistry or the biology of the system. But they actually refer to people like me to understand which methods are best, which accuracies will you get, which uncertainties, which method should you use. Um, one thing is that um, NMR chemical shifts, spin spin couplings, might be a property, NMR spectroscopy in general, might be a property that if you're doing organic chemistry, you're interested in. Um, I can tell you as a computational chemist, if you use standard methods, you will get nonsense. You actually need to do something very, very specialized in describing core electrons to get the right answer. You cannot do it by default. And so what I actually try and train um, my third year university students is going, what's easy, what's hard, where do you need an expert and where can you do it yourself? And I guess just um, oh, following on from what we were doing before, if we put a molecule in a computer and we use all these methods, and you might also go, well, this is the OH stretch here. Don't think I've got a diagram of it. Oh, yes, I do. This is the OH stretch. Um, well, it was working for a little while. And this is at 4,000 and you're like, oh my goodness, Lo, that's a really bad prediction. But that's actually something we know as quantum chemists and we approximate it. And so if you think about the errors associated with a calculation, we go from theory to experiment. And there's all that model chemistry, the Lego bricks that we were talking about, but there's also maybe you weren't actually modeling what you can measure experimentally. And I imagine that that's much more of a problem than people give it credit for. So you can talk about the error of the solv solvent or the Lego bricks or things like that, but um, if you're trying to do PKA and you're actually measuring something that's, oh, I'm not very good at this analogy. Um, the vibrational frequencies are the ones I know, sorry. Um, harmonic frequencies versus fundamental frequencies. Um, there's actually a scaling there and a difference. So just think about a property. I guess what I want to say here is your theory and your experiment might not be measuring the same thing. Make sure you're talking to each other enough to figure out the differences and the errors and the approximations you're making there. Don't just ignore them and go, the theory is bad or the experiment's bad. Honestly, it's probably a bit of both. But we can correct for it in this case. 3,700 isn't right, but this was a calculation we did in about two minutes. So, um, and then one of the power of computational chemistry nowadays, and we're actually here moving more towards big data, machine learning, data science, um, that was manually. You can get a computer to do that a thousand times. And look, you need a PhD student that's, um, you know, a bit crazy, but excited, um, dedicated but you can definitely do it. And so he's developed an approach where you can actually start with a SMILES identifier is basically a molecule described as a computer would describe it. So um, it's not, it's not going to be a SMILES code, but say you're describing ethane, you could just go C dash C and the computer might go, well, it's going to link all the hydrogens in it to make full valency. There's a language that we use as, on computers to describe molecules, but that's talking about its connectivity, we actually need to go to three-dimensional structures. And again, there's computer programs that can go from atomic connectivity to three-dimensional structures. You generate input files, you do exactly what we did there, but do it with a computer, basically. Um, you check your outputs and most of the time it works, sometimes it doesn't, and you go back and fix it. But then you get the data and you analyze and visualize the data and then you figure out what on earth you've got. And I would say from the experience that I've had with working with lots of junior students, the figuring out this first bit, you can teach someone how to do that. 
Um, the data analysis and visualization is actually often quite challenging because they've got data and they're like, well, so what? What does that matter? Why do we care? And I think as more senior people in the industry, um, you know, more experienced than my students, sorry, my students are very young, <laughs> um, you can offer what do we care about? Which properties are important? Which are unimportant? What is the things that you haven't even measured? And I think that getting the data knowledge, the, the expert knowledge into the um, computer thing is really important. Um, I did just wanna talk briefly about what things that you can calculate. So relative energies, spectra, um, dipole moments. Basically here, some things are easy for a computer and some things are really hard. And you need to sort of understand which is which so that you can figure out what are you doing experimentally and what are you doing computationally. So for example, figuring out the boiling point of water computationally is really, really, really hard. <laughs> Doing it experimentally, you just need a kettle and a thermometer. So um, it's really important to be aware of the differences. And the other thing I wanted to tell you um, in this space is that if you're looking at a simple system, you can do it really, really accurately. But if you're looking at a protein, you're probably going to need to think of the amino acids as the block, not atoms and electrons. And I mostly work up here where we're dealing with electrons and as many, as accurate an answer as we can. I sometimes work here in density functional theory, which is still quantum mechanics. Um, atomistic molecular mechanics. So you're actually going away from quantum to molecular mechanics. I stop about here because that's all I can, this is too big for me. But this is actually really important when you're doing drug binding, protein binding. This is really where a lot of the biochemistry will come in. And when you get too big for that, you're gonna start looking at coarse grain modeling. Um, so I did just wanna briefly, I thought it might be interesting to think about artificial intelligence and by that machine learning, deep learning, neural networks, all those sort of buzzwords that you might've heard around the place. And there's buzzwords because it's gonna be a billion dollar industry now and very close into the future. And you might have, you like a lot of people that I've talked to, machine learning, it's really scary and the computer figures out something. Look, it's not quite that simple, but really it's a sophisticated fitting. The simplest machine learning is just linear regression. Here's a line, fit it. It's all about um, the data sets that you've got and the cleanliness of the data set is actually the most important thing. Computationally generated data sets are definitely one way and that's why the computational chemistry links in, but the accuracy of your data set is really important. I just wanted to share this one and I'm aware I'm probably coming to the end of time, so I'll um, wrap up in a moment. But um, I really liked, I, it's, this is from a conference. Um, I stole and acknowledged the slide. So go to him, these people if you wanna do this. But you start with um, a million potential compounds. You pick 500 randomly and do physics quantum chemistry. So that's the density functional in modeling. And then you put it and you train a machine learning model. And then you can actually get to the point where you've got some molecules that you think might be useful and you synthesize molecules and you're actually basing it on this physics machine learning and getting a much more accurate answer of millions of compounds versus just basing it on your natural, um, naturally derived products and things like that. So I do recognize I'm getting to the end of time. So I might skip a few slides, say thank you to my students. I think that's really important. Um, say that if you're interested in doing some outreach, I definitely do a lot of work in that space that I won't talk about too much. So basically I get students into the university and they do research for a week and I've got nice pretty pictures of them. So I like to put them in my slides um, and that engagement with the impact of what they're doing is really important. And you might, one thing that might be relevant to this audience is you might've heard of workplace integrated learning. So actually getting basically internships, um, getting university students into industry to figure out what is it actually like. And I invite you to sort of, as you're going, well, if you've got any opinions on what you would like me to teach the university students so that they come out more work ready, then I'd really love to hear about them. And the workplace integrated learning is a way that you can help them. And I've got contacts if that's something you're interested in. And the last thing is we do have a new degree at UNSW. Um, that's pharmaceutical medicine and pharmacy. And I'm actually teaching into the first year chemistry cohort and trying to learn as much as I can about where basically physical chemistry links in with pharmaceutical chemistry. So I've got arsenic poisoning, 
chelation for heavy metal poisoning, protein structures and geometry of drug binding. And if you've got any other examples that can tell me why chemistry is important, that'd be great. Thank you very much. Um, and our next speaker will be joining us online. Uh, Trevor Scurry is joining us from Melbourne. Trevor is a pharmaceutical professional and plant manager by background. And Trevor founded consultant company FarmOut in 2006 and continues to be managing director from the inception. Trevor has over 30 years of practical hands-on international industry experience ranging across facility design construction, validation, production, and logistics. He has successfully supported many companies achieve US FDA, MHRA, or TGA, GMP certification. It's a lot of acronyms. Assisted international regulators to achieve successful PICS membership. So Trevor, I hope you're there. Uh, Scott will uh, connect with you shortly. Are you there, Trevor? I am, yeah. Everybody here, Trevor, okay? Yep, yeah, that's good. Just share your screen, Trevor, and I'll make sure I get it on the right screen this end. Should be sharing my screen now. Scott, is that screen shared now? It is. I've just got it on the wrong one. I don't know if I can. Uh... Bear with me a second, Joe. Go for it. Thank you very much. To apologize that I can't be there in person and thank you um, RACV for um, inviting me to this um, the, the conference and speak. Um, I'm trapped in um, a conversion of four rivers I'm about to be flooded and I've been preparing my property for the last few days, um, building levee banks and, and the like. So. Uh, data integrity seems like a very foreign concept to me right now um, and I've got other priorities but um, thank you very much for your patience and allowing me to uh, speak and present this remotely. Um, I'm not a huge, huge fan of remote presentations and um, honestly wanted to be there in person. Um, I'm going to speak to this guidance which I found particularly useful. Um, as Gay mentioned there's um, a lot of um, overlap between this guidance and there's lots of things already in the um, GMPs of both part one, part two, and the annexes around data integrity. And if you look at the wider um, GMPs in FDA guidance as well, there's the similar table that exists um, in the FDA guidances, for example, the crossovers. Um, but I found this 63 page um, document really interesting. The usual thing with these documents, if you're battling with sleep um, insomnia or, or sleep problems, um, I highly recommend you grab this guidance, read it, and it's sure to put you to sleep. But there's a lot of things that are very interesting in this guidance. When I um, refer to a clause five, like the orange over there, I'm not sure if you can see my cursor, um, it actually refers to a clause in this um, particular guidance. So it's around data governance, um, organizational influences, principles and enablers, paper-based systems, 
Um, often people think when they talk about data integrity, it's it's computerized systems, but uh, most of my talk is going to be around um, log sheets, um, paper batch records, et cetera, not necessarily computerized systems. Section 9 refers to computerized systems, of course. Um, section 10, outsourced activities. And then um, uh, sections 11, um, regulatory response. And section 12, remediation of failures. And if anybody has had a, a failure in terms of a data integrity breach from a regulator, I strongly advise you to go out and actually read that section um, 12, or maybe go to some of the FDA um, citations. They are really interesting in terms of how you should respond to a citation around data integrity. It's like a scale. You can't just respond, well, I calibrated the scale and she's she's great now and everything that um, was wrong with the scale previously was um, not um, is no longer a problem. You'd need to go back and actually understand why the scale missed out on a calibration uh, problem or a data integrity breach, but then also have a broader um, uh, plan to sort of say, well, um, what other product was affected by the scale being out of calibration or, or data integrity issues that occurred, what else actually occurred, uh, caused or was affected by the data integrity breach when you maybe had the traditional tr rogue analyst or rogue engineer, as Volkswagen called the person. Um, so there's a lot of um, good stuff in this particular document, but it's really intended to be written for the inspector. So if you want to get into the head of the inspector, although I don't think you should be running your facility on the basis of just getting through um, the GMP inspections, I think you should be running your facility on the basis of having good data management and good GMP all the time. But a lot of what this actually says in this guidance is just normal GMP or GDP, um, depending where you fit on the regulatory the regulated landscape. Um, some of my talks are going to be really basic stuff, but I am going to just pull out a little bit and talk a little bit at a higher level. So we talk about data integrity and data quality, and I think both um, these interactions are really important. However, I think uh, over over overall, there's a um, a glue that sticks us all together, which is the data governance. And there is an expectation that you have um, a good data, data governance system. So there's nothing explicit as far as I can read in the fix part one, part two, or in the, or any of the uh, uh, annexes, as far as I can tell, around data governance. But it is in this PI041 or data integrity guidances. And I'll just expand for, ex for a second. So when we're doing a batch sheet, for example, when we're doing authorization, um, we've become really good at um, filling out a, a batch, a manufacturing batch sheet, and we identify the significant step or critical step. And we go through a process of sign and check by production. I think everybody who's worked in manufacturing has um, an appreciation for this. And then we have a QA that department that typically reviews that batch sheet or lab sheet or critical um, record and then QA looks at it and they say, well, that's a significant step. They agree and then they do a review of that step as well. But we're actually very good at those individual production controls or QA controls or batch documentation review. But we don't actually have a holistic data governance system that looks over across the entire system and says, well, actually, what else is missing and how do we glue all this together? And in fact, are we actually trying to control the, the, the right data? Um, in the first place. So whilst, um, as I mentioned, there's no explicit GMP requirement, it's certainly in, um, in the, the PICS DI guidance um, 41. And of course, there are, there are lots of other sources of critical data, um, be that in maintenance, calibration, or tech transfers. And tech transfers, I think, has become more important from PICS version, I think about 13 onwards, um, it's become more of a vogue. So data set, data in Data governance is the sum total of arrangements to provide the um, assurance of data integrity. And as Gay um, mentioned, there's the Alcoa principles and Alcoa Plus. Um, and the review of the data governance um, systems or, or review management must have, um, or senior management ha are responsible and must have oversight. Um, similarly, um, there should be a um, part of your self-inspection. So if you have any self-inspection process at the moment or procedure and a check sheet or whatever, 
way you actually do this, or maybe you have an independent process that goes through your company and looks at your data governance systems. So you should be adding that to your checklist um, if you have a, a checklist or your self-inspection process as required by Chapter 9, if you're covered by um, Part 1 of the uh, PICS GMPs. All entities are regulated in accordance to the GMP principles. Um, you need to have quality risk management and has to be um, documented as supporting rationale. So you actually got to write out, well, why this is important. And this becomes part of your overall process. Quality risk management, I think everybody is aware, is just becoming increasingly becoming more of an issue. Um, ICHQ 9 has been the draft version of that um, has now been released, the updated version. And with Annex 1 being released, we our count is um, somewhere around, if you count the number of times the word risk is mentioned in those regulations between uh, Part 1, Part 2, the annexes, um, including the um, ICHQ 9, which will eventually become the Annex 20, um, we're reading the risk word now 840 times, which is almost doubling what it was a few years ago. Um, so that's really rapidly increasing um, around um, uh, the, the, the risk and, and applying risk to your process. And I'm going to be talking a little bit around the risk and trying to work out within the GMPs where you have your risk um, uh, risk um, or predicate steps uh, outlined in the GMPs. So um, very similar to GAY, you can actually go and find, um, if you look in part one, um, section five, 1.5, you'll find that there's a part around senior management have, must have that responsibility and there's further sections that won't go through all of them. However, down the bottom here, you see I'm referring to GAMP 5.2 and that's a reference to GAMP um, 5, um, second edition, um, which has recently came up probably about three months ago if anybody's missed it. Um, there's a chapter on um, a special interest section of pendants on uh, critical thinking and trying to make sure that people are aware of having some time and space to um, critically look at your systems and processes and see how you can improve them around your data governments, governance um, of your entire system. So um, self-inspection, um, obviously that um, implies that there's a recorded um, procedure exists and it's documented. Um, the document demonstrates control over the life cycle, including when you um, uh, retire your system. Um, you have routine data verification checks, either they can be daily bat, you know, by batch, which we're very good at doing it by batch, um, and activity needs to be documented. Remember, if it's not documented, it never happened. Um, this reminds me of a story a few years ago when I was working with a company and they um, had claimed that their product was um, shelf, had a shelf life of 10 years. And then as everything everybody knows, you got to keep your, your, your um, data records relating to that batch um, um, past your expiry date of your product. And that meant that the records that were done on old XT machines had to be resurrected. And these guys during the FDA inspection were rapidly trying to solder together some really old uh, machines to ensure that they could retrieve the original records because they'd been archived, but not probably not archived as, as well as they should have. Um, the developing data government system. So you need to identify critical data. And I think um, if you're doing a QBD type manufacturing process, quite often your um, critical quality attributes your critical process parameters, et cetera, would be identified through that process. So it sort of meshes in or links into that overall process. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about predicate rules. Um, a predicate rule is uh, FDA, and borrowing from their language, saying, well, in the GMPs, it states that when you're adding, say, um, an example of this would be if you're adding a, um, a raw material into your reactor, it needs to be checked by someone. So the predicate rule says that it has to be checked by a, a separate person. Um, it does for, go, go on to say that it can be checked by either um, a person or by electronic means as well. And, and that's sort of in the FDA regulations as well. But this predicate rule means there's an independent um, check of that um, of, or verification of that data. Um, identify the risk to different sources of data determine the level of confidence required, establish controls over the data lifecycle, and generate proof order trails, checklists, and summaries of, um, of that data. 
So going through the PICS guidelines and just trying to pick up, well, actually, what is critical data? Um, obviously, in section 1.8, there's critical steps in the manufacturing uh, process and significant changes. And I'm not going to read all these out to you, and I've got another slide following this one. But I, I think you get the gist of what um, I wanted to want to make here. As you can find in your GMP, some of these, um, the, the, the language and the expectation is actually already given to you in terms of um, if you read section 418D, for example, critical process parameters, that would come out of your sort of validation efforts. Um, 431 was, um, would be critical analytical testing, for example, would be critical. So anything that came through a, 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 um, a testing um, would be critical and quite often it would need to be um, verified um, by a second person or um, you need to be careful around that data and make a risk assessment of, of it. Um, which is really interesting, 4.2, critical process should be validated. Um, I would like to go a little bit further out of the sort of immediate scope of um, your batch sheets and log sheets, et cetera, which I've been asked to speak about, and maybe talk a little bit about um, computer system validation. Quite often people um, add a lot of um, screenshots and get a lot of testing, uh, verification or, or additional checking check per, by person of the computer system that would be used in a manufacturing process. Now, again, 5.2, and I think it's been the expectation, is that there is no predicate rule around um, computer system validation, for example. That's not to say that if you have a risk assessment and you had an autoclave and you're calibrate, validating some sort of PLC that did a cycle on an autoclave, which is life-threatening, I'd probably still want to get some screenshots of independent verification of the tester testing the validation scripts when they're performing the verification um, test um, on that computerized system. So just make sure that you can use this language for critical systems and, um, and, and high risk systems or significant uh, steps in manufacturing. You can use that to your advantage and maybe um, cut, a, cut your computerized system validation um, oversight back a little bit if, it's, um, if you deem it to be important to you know, import, uh, you know, important. Um, data integrity um, is in the quality control. Chapter six is all around um, QC. And there's obviously um, additional checks around um, checking the data. So initials of the person performing the test. Um, so a manual entry should be checked by a second person or managed as part of, of a system or a validated system. And um, so the significant steps are also part of this predicate rule um, thinking. Um, so going back to the um, reinforcing, sorry, the uh, predicate rules around the US FDA, uh, PIXDI document recommends critical 108 times. So there's lots of instances there where it's giving you hints around what you should be doing and helping you um, identify um, the, the um, critical information that should be um, recorded into batch documentation and logbooks. And then if there needs to be a second check, on these systems. So I really like this, um, the, the um, PICS guidance, because I think there's lots of practical uh, tips there. And quite often, I think the industry standard is that when you've made an error, you cross it out from sort of bottom left to right, and you initial and you make a um, notation about what the error was, and then you make an explanation as to what um, the, the correction is. Um, so there's many examples of this that suddenly um, make it clear that there's a guidance documents there in terms of what we should be expecting. Um, I'd want to focus a little bit on terms of the design of documents as well. Um, we talk about good design of systems and you can see the top table there. There's um, personal, the, person, the, the, the operator filling in this form or lab analyst doesn't know, need to know if that's to one decimal place or two decimal places. Um, I think every analytical chemist knows that there is significance in decimal points as well. So does a, um, a, a, a number of 5.6 um, fail so, or pass? So therefore, you should be putting in your, um, your, your design of your form should perhaps have check boxes in them. So the operator or the um, lab analyst actually knows what um, significant figures they need to complete. And I think this is when I started talk, talking about um, 
data integrity by design, I think we should go back and look at our, um, our, our forms, uh, either they batch sheets or, or analytical records or even log sheets in laboratories. Um, I think everybody needs to have a, um, a signature register. This is always often a give me for a, a, a company or you know, for doing an inspection. Go up to a batch sheet and, and ask for the signature register. And quite often people either put that on the front of a batch sheet or they have a, a central signature register running the company. And quite often when people leave the company, uh, are they not actually updated? Um, there are times when initials can be um, satisfactory and versus a full signature. And if you go through the PEX GMPs, there does call for initials versus um, um, a, a full signature. Um, scribes may only be used in exceptional circumstances and um, you can't have a second person recording activity on behalf of another operator. I had a um, example a few years ago where um, somebody felt it was quite okay to put the initials of two people cleaning the room to say, well, they actually had cleaned the room and therefore I put down their initials, but, but I didn't actually know who, who actually cleaned the room. So I think what is helpful with the um, data integrity guidance is that it is now um, making it obvious as to who is um, cleaning the, the room around the, or, or recording that activity. Recording around the times, um, obviously you have uh, either paper or digital. If you can have a, a date and time stamp um, on digital signatures, uh, you're probably going to have your date and time put there, as opposed to a paper record, you're probably going to just put the, 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 the date. But um, the, um, it is important to basically write down the um, time as well um, when something's been recorded, and whether you're using 12 hour clock or 24 hour clock. In terms of Date. Um, obviously, we have the Australian system and the American system, and that is really important. So, I think you should define which system you're going to have. And then, quite often, these documents do find their way to other parts of the world where they have a good um, system in place. And I think it's also important to always put the zero in front of a, a date. So, if you look on the 1st of the 1st, 2015, um, that can be altered by somebody else to say it's the 11th of the 10th, or it could be the 11th of October, or um, or the 10th of November, depending where you are in the world. So we think it should actually be important that people always put in the um, the, 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 the the date um, in, you know, in full if they're writing that out, or if it's Microsoft, I always prefer to use the 234 system or 232 system. Um, in, is that two two days and then the month month and um, here here I think it makes more sense. I think like you, um, if you go overseas and you fill out your um, your documentation returning back to the country, you quite often um, get told how to fill out the date. It's D D M M in in likely in grey. That could be helpful to your um, your staff as to um, how you want them to complete their documentation. Um, and the format that you're looking for, especially to new staff. It costs you very little to do this through the design, or why aren't we doing it? Um, I don't see that very often in the pharmaceutical um, industry. And also the confusion around AM, PM. Um, you can cross out the, the AM or PM, depending which it is, and then it's really clear as to what time something happened. Blank spaces, there's a whole lot of rules from the blank spaces that come out of the DI document. and um, Thankfully, also, um, um, the um, cross-out has now um, been made really clear. I'm not going to go through the detail of this, but just that um, if you want to read up on, um, on how to cross out spaces in batch documentation, for example, it's um, given to you. If you want to make a, um, if you have admitted data and you later discover that there's been a, uh, uh, in your batch review or even later, you, you find out that you've actually forgot to write something in. You can't just write it in at the time three months later. That's Gay's um, contemporaneous um, comment. Um, you actually have to write the data in as if you do have a way of verifying it at the date and time, but you've actually got to re record it as an entry at the date of the, that you've actually discovered it, not, um, not later. Um, when you're making um, changes, obviously you can't scratch out like that. You've got to make the correction to be um, legible. Explaining the error, if you've made an error, you, um, you can verify um, that you've um, changed stuff. Remember, if you've um, 
if QA ever reviewed the procedure or the documentation or, or, or documents, you can't um, change your entry and then not send it back to the verifier or QA to review it to, um, um, you know, you must send it back to them, sorry. And uh, I think that's really important. If you don't have sufficient space, it's perfectly acceptable to make a little annotation and where there's more space on the document, you can record your comments or if it's important enough, you can actually record a, um, a deviation um, and raise a deviation for that non-conformance or, or, or deviation from the systems. Um, we often talk about the page numbering. Um, obviously, uh, every page should be unique, uniquely identified. And we always use the example of a parachute or a running down the stairs. And I think you'd run downstairs, but you're running downstairs and you spill all your batch documents, whether they're validation documents, whatever the documentation set is. Um, you can put those all back to the, together again in the right format. So the page X of Y is really important um, to get right. Going back to um, data governance, um, you know, deliberately amending or destroy, destroying GMP records um, to hide or falsify um, data is fraud, and, and it is um, a, a loss of license type of um, activity. And if you read in the back of the, the DI um, um, guidance, the 41, you can see that that's how the regulators classified, and I think that's how it should be because when you start falsifying documents that basically is uh, fraud and you lose the trust of the regulator um, and the trust, I think, of people around you as well. Um, you do not discard a GMP record, which you might think it's a mistake. Um, quite often, I hunt around in rubbish bins. I never used to do this until DI came along and used to be very surprised as to what you find in rubbish bins as well and should be controlling the, um, the, the um, records or the loose forms or logbooks. Um, in fact, my advice is that you should never have any loose logbooks uh, any longer. Um, it's, it's, it's probably a practice that we were acceptable five years ago. Um, all logbooks and all records should actually be, now be banned. Sorry, now should be bound. And it should be really obvious if someone's torn out a page or removed a page. So if a page gets um, messed up for whatever reason, um, it should be crossed out, a little note made as to why you're not using that, that form or page and move on to the next form. It's perfectly acceptable to um, make mistakes and um, you know, sort of say, well, actually, I messed up filling out that form. I'm moving on to the next page of that form um, um, logbook as such. Um, it's not acceptable to discard any GMP records for any reason, um, unless the retention um, period has expired and or approved by quality. And just as a reminder to everybody that, um, you know, like validation documents, can't be thrown away just you know after five years um, they actually got to be uh, kept then could be as long as 20 years until they or until they replace with another full set of validation documents for example in terms of how long you're to keep um, uh, 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 pieces of paper around for records around uh, loose unofficial papers uh, post-it notes etc um, are definitely not um, yeah they definitely do not meet good uh, doc practices I think in the um, yeah, um, uh, current practice. And then the last port of point I've actually spoken about is already. There's a really good um, guidance in the uh, PICS document um, around uh, true copies. I, I really like it, it's a simple uh, process. Um, but if you're gonna be transferring uh, true copies either electronically or paper-based or scan copies across to somebody else, um, just a reminder that it is an expectation that um, the, um, there should be in your quality agreement and a procedure as to how you do data, you know, part of your data exchange between two companies. So if you're going to be taking records for your contract manufacturer and you're transferring um, uh, uh, um, documents between the true copies of documents um, between yourself and a contract the, um, uh, two, two companies, then this should be under uh, control through a procedural and, and also your technical agreement. And I think um, that's just recapping. I'll try to keep it really simple, just um, around um, yeah, logbooks, um, batch sheets, et cetera. And, and um, uh, hopefully that's all. I've met the brief. So thank you very much once again.
Thank you so much, Trevor. And we uh, appreciate your efforts to uh, present for us today with all the challenges you have at home. And we uh, hope everything works out for you, but please stay on the line uh, as we are expecting some questions after our presenters. Okay, thank you. Our next presenter is Seamus Orr, who is the Technical Services Manager at AstraZeneca. Seamus is a qualified and competent technical services manager, having 20 years experience gained throughout the biopharma, pharma, consultancy and medical device industries in Europe and Australia. His expertise includes regulatory compliance, computerized automation, systems commissioning, validation, procurement and project management. Uh, thank you, Seamus. And after Seamus's presentation, we will break for some afternoon tea. You are right. full screen. A second, just for the people online, just give me a second, everybody. Uh, yeah. Oops, that was good to me. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thanks for the introduction, Nisha. And it's great to be back here at the Ride Eastwood, Eastwood Leagues Club for a racy seminar. I always knew I'd say that, I'd be glad to be back here, but you do need some constants in your lives. And this is certainly one that I enjoy. Um, look, uh, today I'm gonna to talk you through data integrity as it applies to manufacturing systems. We've had um, three great talks already and uh, three tough acts to follow. Um, I was clicking my heels coming here this morning uh, or this, uh, this morning and uh, then Dr. Laura McKemish got up to talk and computational chemistry is certainly not my forte but it, 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 how it links and the big data and the, the, how we manage that data and, and translate that data certainly is important to us. So I'm going to talk you guys through how data integrity is managed, controlled as a manufacturer, um, how, uh, how we manage data integrity for existing systems before data integrity, what, it, was always in, it was always there as Trevor's slides mentioned, um, but also how we do a, a data integrity evaluation and assessment. And then how do we strengthen that data integrity going forwards? How do we make it better? How do we make it smarter? How do we make it more, um, I guess, coherent and le less, less error, um, uh, I guess, less, less errors in the data? So I'm going to do a bit of a, a freshen up before, before our afternoon tea. And I'm going to get three volunteers, if I could, from, from the table. We'll get one from Mr. Bog's table. We'll get one from the AstraZeneca table. And we'll get one from our um, Chen's table as well. So um, what, I'm going to ask one person on that table to, um, to... No, you're not going to be speaking, so don't worry. I'm going to get you to, um, to basically uh, tell me how you pronounce the last speaker's surname. Now you're going to think about it for five seconds and you're going to whisper it to the person next to you on the table and you're going to tell me how that surname is pronounced. So I'm going to give you five seconds to do that. All right, we'll get AstraZeneca to go first. How do you pronounce the last speaker's surname? Incorrect. Next, next table. Yep. No, you no, you're not going to speak. You can, you can whisper it. Who, so whoever whoever uh, opted to to choose how the name is pronounced doesn't have to speak. Yes. 
correct? So uh, we don't have to go to the third table, but we've just broken pretty much every Alcoa principle on there. The data wasn't commensurate, it wasn't accurate, um, but you can just see how we've, just in a few moments of the, that person being introduced, we've already forgotten how that name's pronounced because it's not, it, it's obviously meaningful to us because uh, Trevor's a good speaker, but we do forget things. So uh, it's just one of the points that I'm gonna make today is data, this transcribing of data or recording of data afterwards, we need to, to stop that, stop that uh, pretty much straight away. So um, we'll give you some examples of how AstraZeneca has tackled um, data integrity um, through digitalization and other programs, and then a conclusion. So controls on data integrity come from three, three groupings, organizational, technical, and operational. There are lots of controls. Uh, Gay covered some good topics in, in system design, system requirements definition. What are the Alcoa principles we're trying to, 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 to meet the requirements of? But in the absence of any one of these, uh, and these are all big controls, in the absence of any one of these, your data integrity program starts to suffer. You start to lose that, that trust in your data and, you start, and your, your decisions then start to, to, to go awry. And if you, we are making some big decisions on data. We're just basically, at a minimum, we're deciding whether it's a deviation or whether it's not a deviation. Where uh, the person that's released for supply is making a decision based on the fact that they trust every manufacturing step, every data, that, every piece of data that was produced in the, in the manufacture of that batch is, it has integrity. So just, these are just, I wouldn't say all of the root causes that, um, in, in terms of why we might have poor data integrity practices, but generally we get poor data integrity when we don't provide the opportunity to be, to, to record good data or to give uh, operators or anal analysts to do what they're uh, trained to do. So we get people to repeat things and, uh, and do things that humans should be, should be doing things that they're they're capable of doing, but when it gets repetitive, you do get to start to, to um, the, you do lose a lot of the, um, the benefits of having a human doing that role. Procedures might ex not exist, might not be well understood. In terms of training and culture, which we've touched on already, um, personnel might be, mightn't be adequately trained. They mightn't have the knowledge of the skills or the oversight for, their, for those duties. Systems. In terms of introduction and management, we need to be across the specifications for the systems that we need. Just because it says it's got Annex 11 or Part 11 compliance doesn't mean that your data integrity is going to be guaranteed. You still need to do a, a, a complex data integrity assessment on that system. Uh, control of the data lifecycle is also important. I'm just going to give you an example of how we the first step of any risk assessment for DI is to understand your data flows. This uh, slide just covers a, a spectra in an analytical lab, but it, it basically looks at the, in a, in a very simple format, the um, data trans, transactions that happen, the decisions that get made, the importance of that data as well in terms of, of, of whether it's a, a, a CQA um, of, of the product that, that you're, you're releasing. So the first step you need to do is understand those interactions and understand what data it is that you're gathering and any interfaces that system has with other systems, which is quite often, quite often left out. Some of the basic requirements you need to assess all of that data that you're gathering for any process are access control, um, control of changes to the system. This is one and certainly for older or standalone systems where systems fall over. Only trained staff with proper access rights should operate the system. Does the system record all the information? Um, we've touched on that earlier, but we need to define and document what electronic records that system holds. What is exactly that we're capturing? What is it that we need to um, be, be across? Uh, controls for data review. Um, who performs them, um, and this should be based on the process understanding and knowledge of that of the impact for that data review. 
Technical data, metadata, and audit trail review, also quite important. And Gay touched on it. Audit trail review, you might have 2,000 pages of audit trail. How does one person um, have the capability to pick out an anomaly or a, um, a, a factor that needs to be picked up in that audit trail review? And then regular system backup as well. Uh, DI evaluation and assessment. Um, there's a must be aware of the data life cycle, the, the data generation from the from the start, the data review, data reporting, and, and data collections. So again, all of our decisions to, to release product is based on the trust that we have in that data life cycle. Do we know what our data retention requirements are in terms of data collection? Are we storing to the to the policies that we have for that for that data? And are we able to pick up failures in terms of data reporting? Would we see the error if, if we, we, we see it? Uh, Laura had a, a good point where in, in this space, you can make errors. In drug development, you can make errors. You'll learn from them. In manufacture, it's really the zero tolerance for, 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 for the, the, these data errors. You've got to be able to have accuracy or be able to detect that failure where you might have it. I'm just going to give you an example of it's already been touched on but um, this is just a standard 10 by 10 matrix in terms of the data criticality um, and whether you need to retain that as original electronic records or metadata supporting the the original record so this is high impact um, criticality of the product are any any qc tests or um, anything that records a manufacturing step that's an obvious 10 in terms of of highest highest category and then highly critical data that needs to be retained as evidence again raw data metadata that supports that release decision um, or stability decisions that's an example of, of of that 10 then basically uh the i'm just going to give you some uh, CPPs that do CQA CPPs that do fall into that 10 by 10 category. This it basically goes all the way back down. To, I'm not going to go through every, but these are some from an Astra, AstraZeneca perspective. These are uh, data blocks or data, data, data sets that we would consider as in having the highest risk priority number um, that do need to be retained to and beyond the, the retention policy. So you'll see there filter integrity for sterile filtration obviously directly impacts sterility. Um, and we, we, it's a risk priority of 100. Same for particle size for reduction and micronization, 10, 10 for uh, critical process impact, and 10 for if we lost that record, how much faith would we have in, in terms of, of release of, of that batch? Then I've basically. Uh, this is just one aspect if we were to, to analyze that data and assess the risk of that data for just one aspect, which is control of changes, which we covered earlier. If you've got a system that has, uh, has comes out with a high data integrity risk, criticality, in terms of managing changes to that, uh, if it's a change to the settings only on, on the first column across there, must be performed by um, this one here must be performed only by authorized personnel. In, in the high, medium, and low, if your system doesn't do that, it's in terms of our perspective, we must take action as soon as possible to rectify that, um, to remediate our systems. We won't tolerate it. We'll put a, a cap in place that will, will be reflective of the, of the risk to, to our batch release, but we must do it as soon as possible. We can't live with that risk ongoing. We can't put it out for five years. We can't put it out indefinitely. We must uh, assess that, must fix that risk as, as soon as possible. Um, the other control of changes aspect of, of data integrity in the second column uh, here is that the individual user identity is unique, must have a unique user account. Um, there diff there's different aspects here of age systems. If, depending on the system itself and what it does, if we don't have an automated system required to control the user access, then we can control it through 
systems like logbooks. We must have a very, um, the, the user must be able to be identified through logbooks, um, either electronic or paper. I'm gonna through, go through logbooks a little bit later as well. So we've covered the, uh, the data integrity in a, in a very uh, fast uh, gunslinger format, but um, what is the expectation ongoing? Um, we've covered it in, I think, in, in one of the, the PI guidelines earlier. Um, I don't know if anybody spotted the, um, the data integrity issue on today's flyer, but um, it's reference PE914, but I'm just going to cut some slack and say the flyer was out before the 30th of April, so it's all good. Um, the, uh, so the compliance plan is meant to be a living document. It's not meant to be a write and see and, and hope that nobody looks at it again or that it's not inspected or that the data integrity issue goes away or maybe it wasn't an issue to start with. You must produce a plan which, which basically uh, nuts out in stone what it, what it is you're going to do over the next few years in terms of your systems, what is your at-risk systems, what are your priority systems. Um, so you've got to identify the gaps. Uh, this is just a, a, an extract from a plan on one of our sites, um, just in terms of uh, what it is where we have to update the site inventory list that was done, revamp and updated the and train out on the DI processes and the compliance plan and why we're doing it. You've got to get stakeholders on board. Um, but it's a sustainable part of the site's culture. And then systems should be reviewed, high risk systems, maybe every year, it's your decision. Um, medium, low risk systems, maybe every three, three years. But it's, part of, it's meant to be part of your periodic review. Um, I'd also say that your periodic review should identify any potential gaps that you haven't already identified through the compliance plan. So if you're doing a periodic review on say a, an autoclave and you find that you've had four sterility failures uh, that you haven't picked up, then that needs to feed back into your compliance plan as well. It can't just, so periodic review is very important to ensure you're, you're, you're uh, staying in control. Uh, the next slide, this is purely my opinion. Um, I don't, is what, what are the potential solutions for data integrity? Yes, we've gone through them. Um, we, we do have uh, the compliance plan. We've done our design. We've done the data integrity risk. Um, we've got our plans in place, but how do we ensure systems are more capable or better in future to, to, to be guaranteed the data integrity that we don't have to do compliance plans? Um, and I think we're already there. Um, Industry 4.0 has been around for some time. Uh, Gay touched on cloud computing. I think about 10 years ago in this room, perhaps we were, we were talking about cloud computing and, and thinking, would we do it? Would we not do it? Who owns the data? Can we trust it? Is it going to get lost? I challenge anybody in this room or online to tell me, uh, give me an example of an EQMS that isn't based on the cloud at this point. I think we've adopted it very quickly, but um, I think the industry 4.0 gives us a, an opportunity through uh, identifying where we can have, have a, an opportunity to uh, lo mitigate the risks completely with a lot of electronic logbooks as an example. Um, uh, virtuosi, uh, virtual reality training, another classic example of where we can really mitigate the risk of data integrity. Um, we work in, in, a, in a sterile environment where we do a lot of interventions, a lot of medias in a sterile environment. It's very hard to make sure logbooks are there when interventions happen so you can record them at the time. Um, so we can't really accept that we're gonna have an, a paper logbook for that going forward. There are devices that you can bring into a sterile facility, into a, into a grade B, grade C clean room, which will record those events for you. Um, I'll go through some more technology in a few later slides, which um, can be adopted to, um, to record those events as well in real time. So 
Industry 4.0, some will see as a problem. I think it's the solution to the problem of, of the data integrity that we, we have. Because in terms of lean operating principles, it's our, our, our patients is ultimately the person that we're trying to, is our customer, the person that we need to give the value add to. But our operators are also our customers in terms of systems. They use them routinely day in, day out. We need to listen to them. And, and know what their problem points are in terms of, of, of using systems as well. This is just the uh, sort of uh, framework of quality 4.0, which is quite aligned with industry 4.0. So don't read too much into the terminology, but uh, using industry 4.0, quality 4.0, we can have quality collaborators to, to make sure we make the right decision at the right time. Make sure the data is there. Um, make sure that the data is available to be reviewed and it's not in a system or in a logbook that's in a, in a plant room somewhere. So is the data available? So Quality 4.0 gives us the uh, standardization of a lot of these um, processes in terms of being able to have that data available to the person making the decision at the right time. Um, recently, we'll go through it. We've uh, gone with a full, fully integrated uh, EQV system, electronic quality vault system, which is basically an EQMS for every quality management system in one place. All periodic review is linked to every entity that we have. Um, so we ensure that the data is there when we need it. Um, Hackathons, also very um, uh, popular buzzword at the minute as well. So say you have six, uh, six uh, systems that are, are really becoming a data integrity issue for you. Uh, Pfizer spending millions on uh, two-day hackathons um, throughout, throughout their sites. ISP are running hackathons as well. It's basically putting 20 graduates uh, 20 people from industry in a room for two days, giving them six problems and basically look, what are the tools that we have through industry 4.0 that we may be able to use to solve these problems. Now they may come out of there and have two that they can solve, but that's two of the six that you can, you can uh, lower your mitigation, have the mitigation for your risk there. So a really uh, innovative way to solve real world problems um, through, through collaboration. And that's what quality 4.0 is about, is we don't have a sterile team working completely in a silo to quality. We don't have quality working in the silo to analytical. We don't have that. So everybody talks together on one system, one integrated system. So this is our vision for digitalization. We've been on, on this uh, journey for some time. Again, this is about providing value to our patient. Um, can we, can we make it better? Can we make better decisions? Can we do it right first time? Um, there are plenty of opportunities, plenty of systems available to us to do, to do our roles better and to use human intelligence for, for, better, for better cause as well than repetitive tasks. So I'm just gonna give you a quick introduction to Global Validation Management System, which is GVLMS. Uh, we launched that late last year to all sites. It's one system for all validation activities, for all revalidation, for all process validation, for all equipment validation, computerized system validation. It's all in one spot for all sites. We use the same templates. We use this for, for this is New York, Westchester, uh, Wuxi, China. We all use exactly the same template across all sites, which makes sure we standardize our, our approach. We learn from that approach as well. So any learnings that Wuxi have, um, or Taizhou will have, we learn from them as well. This is what Industry 4.0 is about. It's standardizing with a view to everybody learns at the same time and has that opportunity at the same time. So uh, sometime next year, we'll go live with online execution, which again is a, is a major milestone in terms of the data integrity piece of recording things on paper and having that reviewed. If it's online, the more better chance you have of a standard being met of the execution on that document. Um, it allows mobile device access. There's, it, there's a lot of benefit to, to rolling out integrated systems. 
So another example of, of lean enablement, uh, using a disruptor to, to standardize what we do. And I think we'd all, I think intern, internally we'd all agree we're, we're better off with that, with that system. It's completely integrated with our, sorry, I'll go back to that slide. Completely integrated within our uh, EQV. So the whole QMS is captured under that vault system. Clinical, all the way from product development, regulatory, quality um, are, all, are all in that, in that vault. So um, you've got really good visibility when it comes to product review, what complaints we've had from that system that might, be res might, might result from that system. Um, whether we've had any anomalies with any of the maintenance for, for that system for that year as well. We've gone through the visibility, simple systems, modern look and feel. It's one system with a standardized approach which we can all learn from. Um, there's efficiency saving there in terms of using a template rather than generating a document from scratch each time as well. We've I covered a lot of the tangible benefits from EQV that uh, combined EQMS. We've also rolled out a, uh, this is back in, in 2018, voice directed technology. Now we talk about logbooks, having the logbook available when you're doing the task, you're doing the task with one hand and writing with the other hand, is the logbook even with you at the time? Uh, line clearance, I think it's an issue for everyone um, and it's quite, difficult to do line clearance in one sweep whilst trying to make sure your records are filled out at the same time. So we saw the opportunity to have voice directed te technology on the line for the person doing the line clearance. This basically empowers them to, uh, to take instructions on the line with the visual aid of how they do that role, um, give instructions back, ask for more help, give voice responses. If they've done a task, they can say task complete. That ticks to say that that task is done. That then is the electronic record for the completion of that activity. So th that's one opportunity we saw where we had issues. We've, I mean, we still track it through, through, through review, but um, certainly a big win for us. Um, another digital tool that we use is Tulip. It's, uh, it's, uh, uh, commercially available application out there. It basically is a layman's tool to create uh, apps without coding. Um, so we're using this throughout our sites. Um, so it's basically a tool to put your standard work instructions onto a uh, iPad, a Samsung, whatever you want to put it on, and to have those, those, all of those instructions given to the operator with the visual aid on the line to do to do those tasks. So a bit like the visual, the voice directed technology, but this is the the app to to um, we can put any any one of our processes on on Tulip. We've quite a few coming out um, in the last few last few months. We can replace a lot of logbooks with 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 systems like Tulip. Um, good for decision making. Good for basically. Um, a visualization of how you complete work instructions and checklists rather than 50, 50 pages of words, which nobody likes. Um, that's just uh, voice directed technology again. It does interface with our, with our batch release batch manufacturing system, our MES. Um, so not only does it record it within the application itself, it feeds back to um, our manufacturing execution system and becomes the the complete electronic record for that batch then. Um, there's other avenues of, of, of uh, in terms of, uh, you know, cameras and motion detection and, and creating a standard with a camera for a line clearance um, that you can uh, implement as well. Um, so that's, uh, we haven't gone down that avenue yet, but that's another, another opportunity for us. So that integrity considerations, we've got the controls, uh, but all of those controls need to be kept in place and monitored through internal audits to make sure that these processes are still working. Do we still have that embedded quality culture to communicate any potential issues? Have we an open, an open floor for, for communication? And uh, really problem solving, continuous improvement, 
hackathons, whatever works for like whatever gets those problems identified. Then just to conclude, I think we've covered a lot in the slides, have clear roles and responsibilities in terms of who's performing the compliance plans, expectations of them, um, project culture or pro the culture for uh, data integrity should be clearly embedded in, in your roles and responsibilities. I'd say focus on mitigating risks of human error. That's where a lot of your data integrity issues are going to come from. Remove that dependency where, or reduce it at least where you can. I'm not saying that, but that's where the benefit of Pharma 4.0, Industry 4.0 comes in. Do create that culture. And where we've seen where we've got a lot of, a lot of uh, traction is move towards those paperless digital operations. You then would seem we've been through two audits in the last three weeks. You're not going through archives to, to go and get the record. You're not going off to your offsite storage location and can, can I have that back? Is it even there? You know, the, all the doubt that goes through your mind, it's there on the system when you need it, when you uh, you've maybe 20 minutes search and you've got the, got the document that you need. So move towards those paperless digital operations, real-time recording database and trending. And no transcription. I don't think there's no room for it. We've got systems to, 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 to not do that. So let's get away from transcribing any data where we can. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Seamus, and uh, thank you for sharing some insights from AstraZeneca with us. Uh, we're going to break now for afternoon tea, and we will resume at 3.40. So for those people online, uh, 3.40 will be restarting. Are you Brucey there? Can you hear us okay? Yes, I can, Scott. And can you see your presentation on the screen you're in, Bruce? I can indeed. Okay, great. I'll, I'll push it through the slides, just give us a shout. Yep. Great. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Bruce Potter, and uh, this afternoon, I'd just like to take you through coding creation and scanning. Uh, the two types of codes really that I'll be speaking about today will be barcodes and pharma codes uh, and uh, how they relate to uh, our pharmaceutical industry. Um, next slide, please, Scott. So what you see on the screen now uh, is something that looks very different to the barcodes as we know them uh, today. But uh, that, in fact, is uh, what was the first barcode uh, ever created. New slide. Uh, the evolution of barcodes. Uh, the barcode was patented in 1952 and was first commercially available in 1966. However, it soon became apparent that guidelines around its use would be needed. And in 1973, industry leaders came together to create a single standard for product identification, uh, the barcode. The EAN uh, UPC barcode is used more than any other type of barcode and is uh, considered the original barcode. Uh, this type of barcode has been used to identify millions of trade items, both products and services, ever since. New slide. Recognised at any retail point of sale, EAN UPC barcodes are scanned by opti-directional scanners, meaning they can be read right side up or right side down by scanners, which makes them a quick and efficient barcode for high volume scanning situations, such as supermarkets or pharmacies. In 1974, the first UPC scanner was installed and the first product to include a barcode was the, uh, a packet of Wrigley's chewing gum. And Today, barcodes capture an incredible amount of information about products and services, which deliver benefits that were barely imagined 40 years ago. New slide. Barcodes are an essential part of the supply chain. Having evolved from carrying a unique identifier of a particular product, a trade item or object, and 
these everyday barcodes, whether they are 1D, 2D or 3D in the form of a GS1 2D data matrix barcode, are the data carriers that are used across the globe to transform supply chain efficiency. Most of these data carriers can be scanned at any point in the supply chain to help identify, to capture and share information about tradable items, assets, logistical units, shipments, physical locations and more. There are a range of data carriers to suit different uses and applications and each are designed to help improve supply chain efficiency and accuracy. New slide please. Types of EAN UPC barcodes. Well, EAN essentially just stands for European Product Code and UPC the Universal Product Code. And in Australia, the four most commonly types of these barcodes are, new slide, the EAN 8. This encodes a GTIN 8, which is allocated directly by GS1 Australia. And these barcodes are used to identify small items only. Uh, there you can see there are eight human readable numbers, which is shorter than most commonly used GTINs. Next slide, please. The EAN 13, this encodes a GTIN 13 and is used to identify the vast majority of trade items in the retail supply chain. Some of their examples of uses would include retail items that cross point of sale applications, everything from grocery items, products found in pharmacies and supermarkets, and pretty well any retail outlet. New slide, please. The GS1 data matrix. The global healthcare sector has identified its use as, a long, as its long-term preferred barcode. And these compact two-dimensional barcodes hold a large amount of data in a relatively small space. New slide. With the ability to capture up to 2,335 characters, a GS1 data matrix is used to identify very detailed product information. For example, specific parts of surgical instruments. The GS1 data matrix has inbuilt error correction, which allows it to compensate for lost or missing data or damage to the barcode, making it very accurate and secure. New slide, please. Some of its common uses include etching onto medical instruments, representing URLs on grocery products. It has the ability to encode large amounts of data, of variable, large amounts of, of variable or dynamic data whether it be lot number, expiration date, serial number, all at high production speeds. They can be used for direct part marking, e.g. the marking of, of surgical instruments. They're great for efficient marking of regular packaging for many medical products and used for global legal and regulatory requirements to dictate the placement of data in a barcode simple. They're extremely effective for the traceability requirements for both pharmaceuticals and medical devices. New slide, please. The GS1 QR code, it's recently introduced to provide another option for extended labeling, such as the representation of a URL with a GTIN on a product. These are particularly useful nowadays for eliminating having a printed leaflet, which would reduces our packaging, which is far better for our environment. Next slide, please. These can contain up to 4,296 characters and the GS1 QR code is a two-dimensional square barcode that carries text-based data. It is designed to be read by specific scanners and smartphone apps. This barcode was introduced to support the representation of two specific GS1 application identifiers. The A1, the O1, this is the GTIN, and the AI8200, is an authorised URL. Additional information can be encoded if necessary. 
And the use of this barcode is also approved where GS1 has approved applications that support GS1 data matrix. The global healthcare industry currently only supports GS1 data matrix in their GS1 applications. Next slide, please. 1D and 2D barcodes. One example of a 1D barcode would be your EAN UPC, the 13 digit there on the left of the screen. And 2D barcode examples could be either the GS1 data matrix or the QR code with the GS1 digital link. Next slide, please. Creating GTINs using the GS1 check digit calculator. On your screen currently is uh, a screenshot from the GS1 Australia website, the check digit calculator. Next slide. After signing up to GS1 Australia, your company is assigned a GS1 prefix. You can create barcodes by using the GS1 check digit calculator. This is a simple tool that is available from GS1 Australia's website. It generates the check digit, which is the last number of each barcode. In the case of an EAN 13, essentially, the barcode contains two sets of numbers, an eight digit global prefix that identifies your business and a five digit product serial number that allows you to bring up a product's information by scanning the code. GS1 Australia offer a service where a range of factors can be tested, including compliance to global standards, size, color, print quality, numbering, and more. Once tested, GS1 will provide you with a barcode verification report indicating the compliance of your barcode and if necessary, any changes you may need to make. For any product ranged in grocery, it's essential that your barcodes are verified by GS1 in order to be accepted by the major supermarket chains, whether they be Woolworths, Coles, Aldi, or IGA. Next slide, please. As part of your artwork creation standard operating procedure, you should keep a thorough and centralized database cataloging the GTIN and which product it is assigned to. When you're assigning a new GTIN, verify that the new GTIN you're creating is unique against your existing GTINs. It's highly recommended to ensure a GTIN is not used twice concurrently. If you use a GTIN, it's strongly recommended you do not reuse the number so as to avoid any resulting issues in the supply chain. Indeed, you cannot reuse a regulated healthcare barcode. The size and placement of the barcodes is Right, sorry about that, everybody. And hopefully everyone on Zoom can hear me as well. Well, I'm just going to finish off this presentation because Bora or Bruce isn't here. So I'll just read it out. Apologies, but that's the best you're going to get, I'm afraid. Um, so sorry about that. Um, I'm Scott, by the way. Um, so I think we're up to this slide, I think, where we were talking about um, using GTINs, particularly 2D data matrices, enables us not only to improve supply chain efficiencies, but to able to track and trace products at various points of the supply chain. In the pharmaceutical industry, this is especially important for the following reasons. They provide the ability to comply with regulatory requirements and guidance on recalls, efficient and effective logistics management, reduces business risks above and beyond legal compliance, product authentication and anti-counterfeit measures and brand protection. Yeah, okay. Um, in terms of um, 2D matrix barcodes and TGI 106, um, there will be an increased take up of the GS1 data matrix um, barcodes in the Australian pharmaceutical industry. Now you might notice me say data and data interchangeably because I am English. So I do apologize there <laughs> to everybody, bear with me. Um, so, um, you know, if the opportunities is technology in other parts of the world is anything to go by. Uh, many overseas pharmaceutical markets in North America, Asia and the Middle East already use the 2D matrix barcode successfully. And indeed here in Australia and the TGA have announced the introduction of TGO 106 which comes into effect in January, 2023. 
Um, so obviously the Australian market will come in line with the rest of the world or other ones in the world. Uh, 106 is designed to put uh, in place minimum technical requirements to ensure the effectiveness and functionality of serialization and data matrix codes, where sponsors intend to use such technology for medicines supplied in Australia without mandating the use of such technology in Australia at this, at this stage. In doing so, the order will support the safe use and timely availability of medicines in Australia, for which technology is utilized, having the ability to record substantial amounts of key data and be able to see in real time uh, significant assets to any manufacturer, product owner, and the benefits of improved traceability, you know, you know, must be viewed as being invaluable, really. GS1 Australia. He's back online, is he? Well, there you go, then I'll let him talk. <laughs> there he is. Oh, I'm very sorry. I don't know what happened there, but... Uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't you, it was us. Don't worry, you carry uh, on now. Okay. Um, so uh, GS1 Australia are always happy to assist with any query surrounding assigning GTINs. I've always found them to be extremely invaluable uh, whenever I've had any queries and uh, they often do come up. Uh, they have excellent resources available, particularly for the healthcare industry. Next slide, please, Scott. Pharmacodes and their use in the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, on your screen there, uh, there's two examples of pharmacodes, one on a uh, carton and one on a uh, folded leaflet. Next slide, please. The pharmacode, which is also known as the latest code, is a binary code that is used in our pharmaceutical industry as a packaging control system. It's got a single track and a double track variety and uh, there are regular and many options. Next slide, please. Uh, the two type, main types of pharmacodes that we at Aspen use are the regular pharmacode and the mini pharmacode, as you see them on your screen. Uh, basically, the only differences are, are the sizes, uh, both of the thick and thin bars, the binary, num binary codes, uh, and also um, the size, should you have a small label, uh, a mini pharmacode is often used uh, in order to uh, allow you to uh, include a pharmaco. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, at Aspen Australia, we use pharmacodes on printed packaging, such as unit cartons, labels, label leaflets, leaflets, and some of our foils, um, mainly for our uh, contract customers for the, in, in the case of foils. Uh, pharmacodes match and validate all the component parts of a package to ensure that the right product with all its required documentation goes into the right package. Pharmacodes are only used for internal tracking and each of our production lines have pharmacode readers that scan the pharmacode ensuring correct packaging is used. Next slide please. At Aspen Australia we maintain a spreadsheet of all the pharmacodes in use. And when a new packaging item is raised, an appropriate number is then identified and assigned to the packaging item. Once assigned, we lock the number away so it cannot be used for another packaging item. So we eliminate any duplications or wrong packaging being used in manufacture. Our standard operating procedure requires me to check if the pharmacode number is available and check against the pharmacode register and also entered the number into our packaging specification program to ensure the number is unique. The second person also conducts the check to minimize any human error. Once the packaging item has been obsoleted from use, the packaging item recorded against the number is obsoleted and the pharmacode number is made available for future use. Next slide, please. Graphic designers have a number of software options available to create the actual barcodes and pharmacodes. It's always highly recommended that the barcodes are produced to meet GS1 Australia's guidelines and that the pharmacodes are sized to latest standards in order to ensure optimal scanning and minimal disruptions in any scanning environment. When applying a pharmacode to artwork, quiet areas to the left and right of the pharmacode must be maintained in order for the production line's pharmacode reader to scan the code unimpeded. The size of the thick and thin bars also need to be maintained for, maintained for the same reason. A barcode creation software program like Agamilk produces compliant barcodes and pharmacodes 
and is an invaluable tool for us. Thank you. That's the end of my presentation. And apologies uh, for the technical difficulties, everyone. Apologies for the standing speaker, more like. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Bruce. Thank you. Thank you again, Bruce. Our next presenter is uh, Clayton Ross, and uh, he's the business development manager at Shimadzu. Clayton joined Shimadzu in early 2011 in a joint sales and service role. After his studies in applied chemistry from Central Queensland University, Clayton has worked in multiple testing laboratories over his career with expertise in a variety of instruments, method development and management. This includes nine and a half years in a TGA and NATA accredited contract testing laboratory. Uh, thank you, Clayton, over thank to you. you. I saw a quick look from Gay there. Yes, she has audited me in my previous life. Uh, <laughs> and I'm one of many business development managers at uh, Shimadzu. I actually am the business development manager for GC and GCMS. Uh, the one for informatics who normally would present at such a, a talk like this um, on compliance is on leave at the moment. So they wrote me into it because they thought I would be a good person because of my background with TGA Contract Lab. Thank you very much. I'll get out your way. Oh, and if anyone uh, can help me with my slide too, correcting the, the text on here, it's very Japanese and I can't alter it, but this is the slides we have to use this year when doing presentations. No, there's no test tubes with colored things on it. Yeah, I know, you know CSI and that has wrecked science for all of us. So thank you. <laughs> okay, so today um, I'm going to talk about some of the data integrity challenges for analytical instrumentation because I do work for an instrumentation supplier, Shimatsu. And although um, this is currently of significant focus in data integrity in the pharmaceutical world and wider industry. Um, it has been around for a long time, 2015-16, originally with the PICS. Um, and there's still a lot of scaremongering, uh, like rumors and whispers. We go to customers and they're like, we still don't understand it. Can you please tell us how to do it? And we're like, we're just part of the solution. We're only a small part as an instrument supplier. Data integrity is much bigger than just what happens on your HPLC, as we've seen in the slides earlier. So, Today, I thought I'd talk a bit about design specification, and this comes from the URS. This is our side of it. And then three paths to data integrity, file-based systems, database systems, and client service systems. And then I really should have not put 21 CFR part 11 compliance here because I'm talking to an Australian crowd, rather more PIX code and GMP, but you all know what I mean. Okay, so the design specification. I still send these out to people and they say, what's this and what do I do with it? Okay, and I see a lot of shaking heads, but it's true. So from our point of view, this is to help both customer and us as the supplier to get an understanding of what they actually want to do. And they're big documents. These things can be 60 to 100 pages easy. Um, and a third of it is nothing to do with us. A third of it, as you'll see on the next slide, is things that really are to do with your operating systems, your domain logons, all those sort of things. Nothing to do with actually, how does that interface with the Shimatsu HPLC? The big thing here is doing this prior to installation, not turning up on the day ready to do the IQOQ and install the software and go, right guys, what's your password length gonna be? So a big thing for us is getting this all nailed down prior to us coming out. Here's the index example for, this is for our client server design specification. And you'll see that the first six items, like I said, they're all things that are really from a customer specific point of view, um, not actually to do with how our server works or our database works or anything like that. There is a lot of other stuff in there to do with um, how virtual systems interact with ours, how the SQL databases are set up multi-data reports for sending things out again in a specific way. Um, but a big portion of it is actually not vendor specific. So once we've got that locked down, then we um, sort of decide, 
are you going to bite the bullet and stick your guns and go file based? And if you do, you'll like my little note down the bottom there that says, good luck, you better have a good IT department because it's not my responsibility. But we are seeing more of this, not so much here in Australia, because the systems that we're seeing here in Australia are relatively small on a world scope. But if you've got 2000 instruments in a lab in India, file-based is where they're going back to. Because when you get to that size, you're gonna have an IT department that's probably a hundred people and they can manage that. So they're tending to go back to this more overseas we're seeing as an instrument supplier. Here in Australia, very few people are doing this anymore. Um, nearly everyone's gone to database or client server managed systems. But the old file based, like I said, oh, got a pointer up here. We've got an instrument. It's a GC because I like GCs because I'm the GC business development manager. And we've got a PC. This is the acquisition PC or the AQ PC, right? So it sends methods off, the machine runs, gets data back, really unsecure unless you really lock that thing down. And then it might be connected to a network or it might not. So you might do manual backups or you might do them over a network. Like I said, not many people here doing it in GP, GMP compliant organizations anymore because it is a beast to organize. Before I go on, I actually thought I might explain what a database is because I get asked this all the time when we're talking to customers, they say, you, you guys come out and you talk DB and you talk CS and what is it? So essentially the database is made by a software like SQL or Oracle. They're just two examples. There are others out there that vendors use and it holds everything securely. So essentially, if this was your Shimadzu symbol here with your, all your data, your Shimadzu data, the database is the shield around the outside that protects all this. It mitigates all ingoing or outgoing and incoming traffic. And the rules of the database, um, they dictate who can control that, how it's controlled, when it's controlled, all of those sort of things. So the database, whether it's on the instrument PC or it's on a client server, it's doing all the hard work from our point of view. So we have the small version where now we've still got one instrument and one PC, but we've got a database around it. So this is what we call our, our DB software. And like I said, it's protecting everything and it can interact with the network for connection for automatic backup and so on. So this is really the minimum that we see as regulated environment here in Australia. You can take that one step further with a client server base, where now we've got multiple instruments going to multiple acquisition PCs, but that's the database is now on a network server. So this server can be anywhere in the world, as long as you can guarantee connectivity. These acquisition PCs though, they do have local temporary databases. So what happens is this writes to here, if the network breaks, it's held on there until the network's reconnected and then it sends it, does it all that automatically. So not such a big deal. And we're seeing more people take this up because it's easier to manage. You only have one copy of your method on here. Whereas in the previous slide, you'd have a method copy on each of these and then you've got to control all of those. When it's this way, it's only controlled here. All data, all methods, all reports controlled on the server. Much easier from a management point of view. If we do a software update, it's done here, not on each of these. So it's IQOQ'd here, much easier. Okay, which is basically what I'm saying in this slide here, pros and cons. Um, these two softwares, if you buy them off Shimadzu, Filebase and Database, actually the same price for the software. Um, Cost you a bit more to do the, uh, the qualification and whatnot on this one, um, but it's a very small amount. The biggest downside to going to a client server is actually having a server. But if you've got a server, and this can run inside a virtual server, um, if you've got one, um, then really not that much more expensive than doing it this way. I won't talk specifics and price because it's not my portfolio. <laughs> okay. So 
does having an IQ instrument and software platform make it compliant? And I think we've pretty much seen today that's a clear no. All right, why? Well, us suppliers are only part of the solution and we're only a very small part of the solution, okay? We're only talking about compliance for data integrity of a very small part of the lab, not the whole system, not your limbs, not your interactions with your customers, not long-term storage of your results. It's just our bit. So that's a clear no on that, okay? Um, it's your responsibility to be compliant. You're the only one as a customer that can control all of those things. And you're the only one that can ensure data integrity and compliance. We will help as much as we can with our part, but you guys have got to work with this and take some responsibility as well. Okay, now I've kept my talk as short as I can, um, but these are some useful links and I believe these will be available later. Um, and so if you click on those, a lot of them you'll see are to our Shimadzu um, US, that's the SSI link. And I've done that because they're very detailed for compliance for FDA, but they do apply here as well because it's following the same guidelines to do with this data integrity stuff. And that's it, thank you. Thank you, Clayton. Our next speaker is our last speaker for the day. Um, but I'd just like to quickly mention, I've been told that we've lost our online questions. So um, if people listening online would like to resubmit their questions, we'd be most appreciative. Our last speaker is Ian Ward, who is the Managing Director at CyberPro. Ian started his career in the 1980s as an apprentice electronics technician with a computer company called Data General. He has been in computers and networking ever since having founded CyberPro in 1995. In those days, the work was mainly integrating this new thing called the internet into a company's network. This allowed everyone to have their own email address and browse internet directly from their newfangled Windows 98 desktops. Fast forward to today and CyberPro is now a Sydney-based team of professionals offering comprehensive IT and cyber security services. To find out more about what this means, please welcome Ian Ward, the founder and CEO of CyberPro. So I just want to make this free. Thank you. Which we get now. So that's fine. Thank you, everybody. Uh, lovely to be lovely to be here. I've learnt a lot today, and uh, and uh, my little cyber security radar pops off when people are talking about um, moving CSV files around and things like that. I could see lots of uh, lots of holes where we where there should be some attention. But just today, I'd like to talk about um, you know a little review on how corporate networks have changed over the years. As my introduction said, I was there in the early days building firewalls, uh, integrating the internet into organizations and really started to see the, the flow of security problems that that brought to businesses. Um, a little review on, on hackers, like we, we can sort of categorize the different types of hackers that we do see and the sort of results that they achieve. So a little bit of review on that. And that will help you guys probably think about where this uh, where you have to worry about this um and i'll explain a little bit about the what we call a security stack 
Um, I'm normally talking to IT professionals and IT departments, so I won't be going into too much detail in that area. I appreciate uh, where you, your guy, where your position is in, in this data chain. Um, we can have a look at a typical hack timeline on, on how a, a, a breach unfolds. And then perhaps what are some of the mitigation stat strategies that can be put into place uh, and um, the evolution of and an introduction to some maybe more advanced techniques. We love acronyms too. So XDR, Extended Data Detection and Response is something that I'd like to introduce to you. And whilst I appreciate you guys are not running the IT in your organizations, you do get to see at the sharp end of it what's going on. And as Gay said, it is really everyone's um, problem, IT. And so I'd encourage you, if you see that you, you suspect that perhaps your systems may not be uh, compliant, ask the hard questions. You guys, see, you know, the amount of problems that we've seen in an organization, maybe a PC, and in your case, sitting in a lab somewhere, sometimes the IT guys don't even know what's on there. So if something happens to that PC, then you might get some blank looks when you say, oh, I just need the data back from that machine because it's failed. So a traditional network, when I first started, everything was in the organization, your computers, your people, um, the internet came along, all we really had to do, we dropped a firewall in place. And what that did was um, we blocked porn, <laughs> we scanned emails and, uh, and blocked people's ability to go to gambling website. That was about all we had to do. But of course, as Clayton and others have, have mentioned, the use of cloud services, uh, things started to go out. Well, the first things that moved out of the enterprise were the mail systems. Uh, they're very difficult to maintain, and they're also a, uh, an, an attack point. Uh, if you didn't keep it up to date, configured correctly, then you actually had a weakness exposed to the internet that could be exploited. So mail systems were one of the first things to go out. And of course, then the next thing was how do we collaborate with other organizations? We started to deal with suppliers. So one obvious one would be um, uh, trucking companies and you know transport systems. We connect and we our inventory systems automatically posted our shipping details to those. The truck turned up, knew what it had to pick up. So we're starting to use the internet as a part of the organisation. Fast forward to today, and in some sense, the internet really is the centre of everything. You still have your business connected to the internet with these external providers. Uh, but you may have multiple, obviously, with companies that uh, in some of the sizes that I, I imagine you guys are, there's offices everywhere. They're using the internet as the backbone. We've got people working from home. Um, so connecting remotely to the office as well now, roaming around. Uh, and uh, that produces challenges for us. No longer do we have the firewall as the gatekeeper for all our employees, our employees and our data is living out there on the internet, working from home. And you have people at home, they're by themselves. That's another, another challenge is they could receive a, a, a phishing email or something and they're not quite sure, but then they're by themselves. They have no one to ask. They can't, sometimes they just can't pick up the phone to say, oh, geez, is this legitimate? And that's an ingress point for, for, for trouble. And of course, the internet brings all the bad guys in as well. They, they have visibility across all of our systems and all those little weak, weak points are, uh, are vulnerabilities. Just bear with me, please. I just want to change the size of this slide a little bit. Just help me go. So, the bad guys. Let's have a look. There's about, there's three types of hackers I'd like to talk about. Um, the first kind, maturity level one, we call, we're calling them. Uh, these guys are opportunistic. They're using publicly available exploits to take advantage of people. 
Um, they're looking for any victim. They're not just looking for a big company, small company. They're just looking for anyone that their little thing in their toolbox can exploit. Um, it's one to many for, the, for them. Uh, it's analogous to someone going around the, the car park at the train station, just lifting all the handles on all the cars. They're just looking for an opportunity. And they've got one little, you know, they have one technique to be able to get. And as long as they get that, they'll get what they can. Um, they concentrate on people um, rather than an entire enterprise. A level two type hacker is a little bit more sophisticated than that. They use a bit of social engineering. That's where we're seeing the phishing emails. They might, might be sending you know, emails about product deliveries. They're, they're hoping to catch and bait somebody. Um, they're conservative with their money and time. So they'll only just try, you know, try it for a short time. If it doesn't look like they're getting away, they'll move on. So, you know, in a similar sense, if you've got a deadbolt lock on the front door of your house and an alarm system, got knock on the door, look in, uh, move somewhere else. So they, they'll move on. And they're easily discouraged. This is a complex slide. I didn't think you'd be able to see it. So this is a wonderful display. But uh, again, this is talking to an IT department. These are some of the mitigation strategies we have our, what we call our security stack. And that's how we layer up a machine. So we'll put antivirus on, we'll put malware on, we'll put monitoring. So all those things and those products and services, they are evolving day to day. So we have the ability to switch in and out those sort of pro those products. Um, the reason I'm showing you here is I just three sort of important things um, is what do we see as some of the most important ways to protect people? Email content filtering and web content filtering. That's how we have the ability. We're hopefully trying to knock out the phishing emails, trying to, um, if someone does get a, a phishing email with a bad link on it, if they click on that link, we can respond to that and say, ah, oh, that's a known exploit site. So we can block that traffic. That's significant. Uh, significant um, benefit and I just the other little point is down the bottom here what's interesting is good old-fashioned antivirus software limited in its ability to do anything and I don't think I've actually seen an, a, a virus attached to an email for I don't know at least five six years it just doesn't get through a modern network so the hackers there yeah, they've had to go around that um, and of course they're not just attacking machines and systems, it's the people. They're calling your, you know, your elderly mother or your grandfather, you know, your father and trying to scam them on the, on the telephone. And they'll just keep going until they get someone because for them getting an elderly person in a first world country who is probably a baby boomer or whatever, a lot of money, that's gold. And it's, it's quite, it's, yeah, it's sad. Then we've got this third type of hacker, and this is the one that's the, from an organizational point of view, this is a scary one. Um, they're less reliant on public tools. Some of them have tools that they've actually created themselves. Uh, they adjust and adapt on the weaknesses that they see through the process. Um, they're focused on particular targets. So they'll go after a particular type of organization with a particular aim. Um, they're willing and able to invest some effort into this because the payoff for them is so large. The other motivation that once they are breached, they will pivot to the other parts of the network. So their end game is to totally own the organization that they breach. And of course, we've seen that in the latest breaches. Um, the job at hand for them is to extend through the network, elevate their privileges, move sideways, and uh, and try and find all the you know the key pieces on a on a company. 
The other task is to create what they call persistence. So if they can get a breach into an organization, their intention is to install some tools so that they can come back. So they can't get just knocked out. Whatever they've used to compromise, they know that may be, may be found and the door gets closed, but they've already now got a bridgehead on the network that means they can persist and stay. So it depends on what their motivations are. Some people, they're just harvesting information. So they'll actually sit undetected on the network for months and months and months collecting data before they get discovered. Uh, these hackers are generally, a lot of them are state, state sponsored. It's big business. Um, there's a current warning out on two Iran, Iranian government based sponsored groups that are targeting transport and health sectors. Uh, in a 2022 crypto crime report, a New York based blockchain analytics company, in other words, they track all the different parts of the Bitcoin network, suggests that 74% or more, more than $400 million worth of ransomware revenue was siphoned off into high-risk wallets whose addresses are Russian-based. They're generally after intellectual property, sensitive information. One copy of that might go to their government sponsor because, hey, it's a lot easier to steal data than to, to uh, research it yourself. Um, the other copy, they'll probably, they'll, the pocket money for them is to try and sell it back to you. These guys are very serious. I have a, a colleague of mine who is what we call a white hat. In other words, he hacks for a living, but he hacks to test networks. In 100% of cases, if they get through the perimeter onto the local network, it's all over. They'll move side, they can move sideways at will in the network with the tools that they've got. Internal networks, we've always built these networks with the, the you know, bolt up doors to keep the bad guys out. But once on the inside, it becomes relatively easy for them to move around. So that timeline that I talk about, hackers sitting on a system. So this, this slide is from a colleague of mine. Um, the first, I can use the little navigator here. So we've got the, the planning and the targeting. Then the actual, once they sort of find, they suspect there's a there's a there's a, a vulnerability. Plan the breach, execute the breach, and this is where the third sense here enumeration. This is where they try and they they're on the network. Who am I? Where can I go? How can I extend? Uh, and then uh, establish this persistence that I talked about before. The end game might be to siphon information. It might be to uh, steal private information for blackmail. Uh, it, and it could be obviously to crypto lock or, or, or lock up that data and then, then blackmail the organization for, for releasing that, that data again. What are some of the mitigation strategies? Restrict administrative privileges. It's pretty obvious, but what one of the main things is don't have a super administrator where the same password for a super admin is used across all the different systems, different administrators for different systems, and they're used in those contexts. That can stop. So the game here is to slow down the hackers. Different administrators, sub-administrative accounts, obviously patching information. The ability to move sideways is where you've got systems that are not patched, not up to date. They can use local exploits. Interesting, a mitigation strategy, we talk about multi-factor authentication. We've all had to endure that. Oh no, here we go, another little code. That's actually a mitigation after you've been breached. 
Because you think about it, multi-factor is only triggered after your password is successful. But it can be the thing that stops them. You've given up a password, they have some access, but then they fall over at the last mark with the multi-factor triggering them and not, not giving them the ability to go to the next, to the next level. Segmenting your network, um, that is, you know, why would the Wi-Fi network, the printer network, the lab network, the corporate network be all one thing? Just because someone can get onto this network, that doesn't necessarily say they should have the privileges to be able to move across these other networks. So that's another um, way to slow these guys down. Blocking uh, traffic for command and control. What that is, is all these crypto lockers, uh, those types of exploits, they need to call home. So when they implement them, they need to get out. So if you've got the things in place to detect that traffic, then you can shut it down. So let's have a look at lim limiting that damage that can be done. Sensitive or archived data, does it really have to be online? I think that's a question that Optus are asking themselves. Did my passport number, which I got the email, and how many people here got an email from Optus to say yeah, they've lost some stuff? Yeah. Why was my passport number from 25 years ago was when I last dealt with them still on an online database? Um, thankfully, passport numbers change, but my driver's license doesn't. So they got that. So they've got my birthday, driver's license. So everyone now is on guard because of that. Immutable storage. Uh, there's a place for this, and I, I've heard it a few times today when we talk about data integrity. It's something that we use in uh, data backups and things. And I, I think that it's for your industry. Immutable st storage, what that means is write once, read many. In other words, you can only add to the data storage. So if you design a database system that that's all it can do is take more data, you cannot destroy old data, then that's an inherent protection. And, and what I hear about GMP, you're not allowed to destroy anything. You can only revise revise, revise. Immutable storage is, uh, I think, uh, very important. We use it in, a, in our in standard normal businesses as in backups. So we will encrypt. In, all data at rest is encrypted. So it can be stolen, but it is useless to who has stolen it. And it's in immutable storage, so it can't be tampered with. Your, uh, Laura, your CSV files are that, you know, a CSV file, fantastic for manipulating with data, but that's the problem. It can be manipulated, forgotten. A table can be taken off it. If you always got a immutable source to come to every time you want a copy of that data, uh, it means it cannot be tampered with and changed. So the previous slide where I said that the, you know, a breach, even we look after systems and when we connect onto a client system to do something, there's always a delay. You say, okay, where's this? Where's that? We're using our documentation. There is time. You've got time when a breach has occurred before they can actually do something with it because they've connected onto a system they know nothing about. They've got to go looking to see what they've got in their hands. So that is what we calling a new technique, we're calling uh, extended detection and response. And what that is, is you imagine if, if a burglar came to your house and you didn't know he was there and he was sort of made camp in your house, what would you see? But there'd be small signs drawers open, cupboards gone through, plates with breadcrumbs on them. You, you, there's little things that tell you something's going on on the network. So as you, every device, every 
PC workstation server, they've all got log files. There's all these little crumbs of information going on all the time. And if you're able to correlate that, then you are actually able to see the signs that something is awry on your network. Um, I have rewritten this a, a few times because I thought when we, last week when I first did a, you know, finishing up, I thought, well, Medibank private, maybe we can say they can be commended because they put their hand up. They say they were breached, but no one got any data. So I'm thinking, oh, they probably had something like XDR in place. So they actually saw the breach before they could then go on and leverage it. They found these guys and, and lock it up. So it, as it turns out, that looks like they have actually um, um, got data. So we use uh, machine learning to aggregate all that information, streaming data from all sorts of uh, equipment across the entire network. And that includes your cloud applications as well, Office 365, things like that. We're getting telemetry from those data telling us where the logins are coming from, failures uh, of logins. Um, it helps us to identify compliance with some of the standards. I don't have GMP compliance there, but we can actually see the act of um, editing documents, moving documents, copying documents. Um, we also do regular penetration testing so that we can actually see if by emission something's happened, we've got an open port on the network. I think I'll speed it up just a little bit here. Uh, active threat hunting, that is where we're actually, you know, we behave like a hacker. We get on the network, see if we can move sideways and we can highlight. Uh, we use the same tools they do to have a little look, see what's vulnerable. Uh, honeypots is another one where, interesting, the, the first job of the hacker once he is on the network is to go looking for, looking for assets. If, you've, if he sees a server called backups, and there's a, there's a folder there called, you know, um, you know, weekly backups. He's gonna go and have a look at it. And that can be a tripwire for our systems. We can set up that as a honeypot so that it attracts the flies and we can, uh, we can respond before something happens. So what does that look like from our point of view? That's a big slide. I did it there for dr dramatic effect, but you can actually probably see a little bit of that on, on that screen. Um, this is just showing us all that un, uh, unremarkable data, but when it's correlated that we can see that, you know, someone they tried to log in three or four times, uh, they couldn't get on, then they've triggered MFA, then the MFA's failed, but hang on, that's coming from Russia, then it came from here, so there's got to be a problem here. Um, so, yeah, it, that is a new technique that, that you've just got to do the mental gymnastics. You've got to say, someone is on my network, they are on my network, what can they get to? How can I detect their lateral movement on my network and respond quickly enough before they can do any damage? And I think I'll leave it there. Thank you very much.